Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, it's really good to see you all here. We've got an awesome session tonight and today, depending on where you are. Um, so as you can see, we've got Bob Sibahar here. And the session today is about metabolic efficiency training and nutrition periodization. My name is Rowie, and as most of you, or if not all of you know, I'm the Director of Business Development at Inside Tracker. but today you're going to be learning from Bob Sibahar. So I'm going to introduce Bob. So he is a board-certified specialist in sports dietetics. Uh, Bob is the former Director of Sports Nutrition for the University of Florida, and served as a sports dietitian for the U.S. Olympic Committee. He actually traveled to the 2008 Summer Olympics as a sports dietitian for the U.S. Olympic team and the personal sports dietitian and exercise physiologist for the Olympic triathlon team. And currently, Bob owns ENRG Performance, and he's also the consulting sports dietitian for the University of Denver Athletic Department. So he's got a bachelor's degree in exercise and sports science, a master's degree in health and exercise science, and a second master's degree in food science and human nutrition. He's a registered dietitian, exercise physiologist, NSCA certified strength and conditioning specialist, and a high performance endurance coach. So he's got quite the resume. Bob is also an Inside Tracker Pro, and he has written several books as well. Um, including on metabolic efficiency training and nutrition periodization, which are the topics of today's webinar. I've personally had the pleasure of doing a nutrition consult with Bob as I'm in the middle of my own marathon training. And I came out with a much, uh, much clearer guidelines for how I should be fueling and an approach that was intuitive and not overly restrictive, which I appreciate very much. So this webinar is part of a series um, that's designed to give you all an opportunity to learn from other professionals in this, in the industry. And just like the last time I have to ask if you, if you can, I would appreciate if you can turn your camera on, um, because I do see these as an opportunity for you to meet and connect with each other. And then the second, um, ask is that it's going to be interactive. So if you have questions, please just write them in the chat, just like we did, if you were here the, the last time, and then at the end, we'll open it up to Q and A and I'll call on you. If you've written a question in the chat box to ask Bob your question directly. And a quick reminder that you should see that this webinar is being recorded and we are going to share the recording um, after the, the fact. So um, I'm going to start with a brief intro Q&A so that all of you can get to know Bob just a little bit. And then I'm going to turn it over to Bob and he's going to jump into the material that he's prepared for all of you today. So Bob, um, hi and welcome. Hello. Thank you so much for uh, this awesome opportunity. Well, we appreciate you making some time to be with us. Um, so I wanted to give people just a little bit of a flavor of who you are so and, and your background. So um, most people probably don't know that you grew up playing soccer. Um, so I'm curious when you made the transition from athlete to practitioner and, and why you decided to make that transition. Yeah, kind of a, an interesting story. I think uh, like a lot, uh, you know, we grew up playing sports. I was actually a competitive soccer player all through my youth and, and up until probably the first part of college. Um, it, it was probably middle of my undergraduate where I started really to question like why the body does, like why could I do this or why can't I do this? Why can my teammates do this? So I was really kind of kind of quizzing myself the whys behind anatomy and physiology and ex exercise. And that's that's like the proverbial light bulb. Like about sophomore year, my, my undergrad, I was like, wow, I would love to really engage in this and study that. So honestly, I always say that what drew me to this field was being an athlete, like a lifelong athlete. Uh, granted, I wasn't national level, Olympic level or anything. So just like more on the high recreational side, really kind of carved my path into what I'm doing now. That makes perfect sense. And it yeah. seems like a natural transition, especially if you know you're not going to go pro um, in that particular right. sport. Um, yep. So, so um, as a practitioner, I'm, I'm curious, and I'm sure this is going to be interesting for the other professionals that are here to, to hear from you. What are the most common issues? I know you work with a lot of endurance athletes. So what are the most common issues that you're seeing in your clients, the ones that you're working with today? Yeah, I would say just a quick background. I was um, 
chastised early in my education uh, from my my preceptor, really my my mentor in school, because and this was a long time ago, right? But when I said I wanted to be a sport nutritionist, that's what we called ourselves back in the day, sport nutritionist. You know, I got laughed at and just like, okay, good luck, whatever. And you know, fast forward, there's there's all these great opportunities for nutrition, but I carved the path into endurance sport. And just like you were mentioning, like I focus on endurance athletes, although I'll meet with any type of athlete, strength and strength or strength, performance, acrobatic, uh, gymnastic, like you you name it. Like I've worked with so many different athletes. What holds true among all different athletes, and this is what I've realized is every single athlete, maybe, maybe less than one percent, but about 99 point whatever percent all have body weight, body aesthetic, body composition goals. And I learned that early on in my career and I was scratching my head, like, why is this so prominent? But I will tell you about 90% of the athletes that come see me really want that aesthetic, uh, be it be it for health, performance, mm -hmm. or a little bit of both. That is really the, the underlying theme that I see in my practice at least. That's really interesting. That's not what I expected you to say. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm not yeah. surprised, yeah. Yeah. Um, what do you wish you knew before you got into nutrition yeah. coaching? Well, so based on that, my previous response, so I was classically trained. My undergraduate was in exercise physiology, but I did a minor in what was called wellness program management, which is basically a long name for behavior change concepts and principles. So I'm classically trained in, in behavior change and in goal setting and you name it, uh, which really helps me as a dietitian. But if I would have known how difficult the behavior change regarding weight loss, body composition, all of that, if I would have known earlier on, I think I would have studied a little bit more. Uh, I continue to do a lot of continuing education on that topic because there's so much always to learn, but I wish mm -hmm. someone had guided me early on and said, Hey, you're going to, you know, with this athlete group that you're going to work with, here's what you're going to see. And I just didn't expect it at the level that I have every single day with almost every single athlete I work with. Yeah. People are complicated. And that's Very probably much so. that you learn, that you learn from Very experience. much. Yes. Yes. That's a good one. Yeah. So the last question I have for you before you dive into the main topic of discussion is that um, it wouldn't be an Inside Tracker webinar if I didn't ask you about Inside Tracker. So you right. are an Inside Tracker pro. Mm -hmm. um, so my question is why you decided to bring Inside Tracker into your practice and how has it and does it help you with your clients? Yeah, it's, it's interesting because, you know, as we spoke earlier this year, I've had clients and athletes bring literally bring me and send me their Inside Tracker Pro data. And I've looked at it for years, right? And, and literally, I'm like, wow, this is pretty cool. And, and they wouldn't show me the platform. They would just show me the deliverables, basically. And I was like, wow, this is like, it's, it's clean. It's clear cut. It's very educational. It's not just a lab, you know, lab analysis. So I've actually been exposed to Inside Tracker Pro for or Inside Tracker for years. It wasn't mm -hmm. until like we engaged and we talked where I was really, I was really intrigued about the tracking and the metrics long term. So what I do as a sport dietitian is I look at chronic behavior change long term. It's not just for the short or for today or tomorrow. So and I've used other blood work analysis, biomarker analysis, and I just was never pleased with the, the tracking, the management, and the education piece. Like I think the Inside Tracker, that's one one reason I moved over to Inside Tracker because the education piece is is phenomenal. And that's kind of what I pride myself on is that education piece. So, you know, under one umbrella, I was finally excited to have everything there uh, waiting for me essentially at my fingertips instead of having to piece out the information. And that's what I did a lot back in the days was, you know, if we get this biomarker, I've got to find this information, put it together for an athlete and then find another one go somewhere else. So it just, it, it simplifies my uh, interaction with athletes, but it also simplifies their educational uh, journey, if you will. That makes perfect sense. That's something I hear all yeah. the time. And one of the, yeah. one of the, one of the main reasons that people want to use the tool. Um, so as you know, I'm, I'm pumped that you're in the program and uh, yeah. I'm particularly excited that you're here today and that um, the people here are going to get to hear from you directly um, about the topics that you've um, kind of coined uh, over the last uh, 10, 20 years that you've been practicing. So um, yep. Yep. I'm going to turn it over to you. The floor is yours um, to awesome. take you into the material for, for today. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. So let me uh, share my screen here. Make sure everything is a okay on your end. Yep, I can see your all screen. Right. You can see all that. Okay, perfect. Let me just try to move these little things over a little bit. All right. So we're good.
Okay, so uh, yes, th thank you. This is I really appreciate the time. I I, I present quite often on these two topics because as as uh, Roy mentioned, I I did coin these terms. It was the early, literally I'm going to totally date myself here. Uh, the early 2000s, uh, I first became I, I got my registered dietitian licensure in in creditation. 2001. So it's it's been literally 20 years since I've been a registered dietitian. It's been 15 years since I've been a board certified specialist in sport dietetics, uh, which only RDs can can get and sit for. But I just want to really quickly, I want to I want to tell you the reason why I coined these terms was I wasn't looking to do that at all. It was really out of frustration of how I was practicing when I first came out of school. And, you know, I was actually, I did it extremely differently than most dietitians do these days. So I was actually a classically trained exercise physiologist first, and then went back to school for even more exercise physiology, as, as you heard my intro, that's my first master's degree. And then I decided to kind of tack on, if you will, the nutrition piece, because nutrition was always so fascinating for me as an athlete. So I kind of did a little backwards and what most dietitians do these days. That said, you in in nutrition we are classically taught and this is the clinical based model of being a registered dietitian we have to do a 9 to 12 month internship after all of our schooling and most of that is done in the hospital and the whole goal of a registered dietitian in a hospital is to feed people appropriately to get them out of the hospital as quickly as possible. So as you can imagine, all the, the teachings and the educations are calorie based, grams per kg or per pound of body weight, like all this stuff. And I was pretty excited about it because I'm very quantitative when I need to be. And so when I first you know, graduated, became an RD, working with athletes, I started using that model, very quantitative, very calorie counting, calorie counting and very meal plan, like specifically in time of day and everything, you name it, cups and tablespoons. And it only took me about a couple months to figure out that's not what athletes actually wanted. And because they told me that basically, like I gave them this great plan and all these cool graphs like Excel and everything, I became a whiz in Excel. And what I heard traditionally was, wow, this is so great. It looks so pretty. But once they stepped into the grocery store, they're like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Like a half a cup of this, a tablespoon of that, like they just basically want to know what to eat. So it didn't take me too long to actually figure out that I had to change my ways if I'm going to work with athletes and being an athlete myself, I never wanted that either. So I had the only reason I was practicing that way is because that's what we were taught in school. Uh, unfortunately, they're still teaching that in school. So this whole nutrition periodization really came out of frustration because as I was working with more endurance athletes, the main question I would ask them is, you know, take for a triathlete or a marathon or who, whoever, you, you name the endurance athlete. Early on in my career, I would always ask, well, what training cycle are you in? Because I'm also a coach, right? So I, I coach endurance athletes. So I, I put my coach's head on and I always ask, what training cycle are you in? And they look at me like I'm crazy. Like, well, why do you need to know that? And in fact, a lot of athletes didn't even know that because a lot of them didn't have coaches at the time. So they were just following whatever, right? The, so I, I started to consult more and more athletes and started to ask the question, what training cycle are you in? I was bringing physiology and endurance coaching into nutrition rather than having nutrition coming into exercise physiology and, and, and energy system management, if you will, in coaching, right? So it, it just made sense to me. Like you should know if you're in base training, you're going to have different nutritional needs. If you're doing some speed work or interval training, you have different nutritional needs. Like I've, I've always learned that that's what we, that's what exercise physiologists are taught. So I kind of scratched my head. Endurance athletes don't know this. So I, I started talking to my fellow coaches. My fellow coaches didn't know this. So I actually started to, to utilize, and I, I, again, coined the term nutrition periodization only for this reason, to get athletes diet sport dietitians and coaches speaking the same language that was my only goal i never intended to coin a term or a concept or write a book on it like nothing but this was back in the early 2000s and if if you follow the sport nutrition field the only thing that you will well the majority of what you see in the sport nutrition world now is periodized nutrition aka nutrition periodization like how should we ebb and flow carbs and protein and fat what we sh what should we do before during and after a workout like all of that is based on periodization of nutrition so that's where that was born about 6 months later i actually was trying to create an easy concept so i was trying to move away from calorie counting and i was trying to think how can i teach athletes 
not to calorie count, not to weigh their food, but to, that's something that just made sense, right? And that's where metabolic efficiency training came into play. And I'm not gonna, I'm gonna put the push the pause button on that because I'm gonna talk about that today, but super, super excited. So that came in in the mid 2000s. And I did a lot of research and a lot of scientific uh, lit reviews on this. And, and just so you guys know, all of this is research-based, it's science-based. I put it, I took all that and I kind of packaged it, packaged it into a practical model. So that's a little bit about the history. I, I like, uh, I, whenever I talk to my colleagues, I, I really want to impart that information. I don't share that information a lot with athletes, but I think it's really important for you guys and gals to understand the history of that and the why behind that. So before I, I get started here, uh, you know, I had a great introduction. Thank you, Roy, for doing that. I just want to highlight, like, what about Bob? The key difference between me and most dietitians is, like I said earlier, I am a classically trained exercise physiologist, strength coach, endurance coach before becoming a registered dietitian. So I have a little bit of a different outlook. And here, here's an example. I, I work with the University of Denver uh, women's gymnastics team, and this is my third year with them. And I remember initially, my initial meeting with the head coach, she was like, she asked me two questions. She said, number one, what do you think about the scale? And I don't know if you've ever been around gymnastics. It's a very, very sensitive sport. It's, it's even though it's all skill-based, crazy skill-based, it's still aesthetics, right? It's how you look in the Leo and everything. So, so I told her my, my, my view on the, the, the weight or the, the scale, and she loved that to death. She loved my, my concept of really not caring about that and looking at performance and recovery and everything. And then, you know, we were talking and she asked me, you know, how do you teach a college girl, right? How to eat, you know, cause she was thinking she grew up as a gymnast. She was thinking, oh, calorie based and, and, and you know, meal plans. And I told her kind of about this metabolic efficiency and it was kind of like a breath of fresh air came up, came about the room. And she was like, wow, thank goodness. Someone is finally not focusing on numbers. Now that said, that's the exercise physiology to me. I'm very quantitative. Please know everything you're going to see in this presentation is actually has a quantitative past behind it, but I package it into what I call real life principles. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Two easy objectives, and uh, I know this is part of a series, and I do want to share this. I could talk for hours. You know, Roy did not mention that. Thank you, because I'm not going to talk for hours tonight. I'm going to split this educational webinar topic into two. So tonight is just describing these concepts. The next one that I'm going to be privileged to do and to offer to all of you will be actually showing you how to do it and provide some case studies to actually show you the impact that it can make in an athlete's nutrition plan, right? So today is kind of looking at the 20 to 30,000 foot view. So let's launch right into the nutrition periodization because this is actually where everything begins. Like if you were to ask me, how do you start nutrition planning with athletes? It is all based on nutrition periodization as the foundation, similar to the concrete foundation in a, in a house, right? So this is my optimal nutrition system. I, I love graphics. I love like, uh, I'm a very much a visual learner, visual teacher, but this is how I work with athletes. So I work in a three-step process. I work on foundation nutrition, which includes, as you can see, includes biomarker testing, which we'll talk about later, includes nutrition periodization and metabolic efficiency. So that's that's the concrete foundation, right? I never talk about nutrient timing, which is before, during, and after training session nutrition or supplements until we can actually describe and, and launch into that foundation nutrition quite a bit. Even though athletes just want to jump the gun and ask me about supplements, I never go there until I, I make sure that our foundation is, is, is very much concrete first. So this is where we're going first. So let's talk about this nutrition periodization. So as Roy mentioned, yes, I have written a book. It's in its second edition now. Now, this is all you need to know about nutrition periodization. As an athlete trains throughout the year, and it doesn't even matter if it's endurance or strength-based or whatever-based, every athlete follows a certain physical periodization model. The terms are different for the mesocycles, and I'll share what a mesocycle here in a second, but every, so, so if you get a team sport athlete, they usually refer to it as preseason, in-season, and off-season. If you get an endurance athlete, usually we talk about base training, we talk about competition, and we talk about off-season or transition season, right? So the terminology is different, but the concept is the same. So as physical training changes, so for Roy, as an example, he's got a marathon in, in late October, right? So he's going to ebb and flow his training volume and intensity. 
And as he does that, nutrition has to support that. If he has a recovery week, if he has quality training sessions, like you have to, what I call eat to train, don't train to eat. And that is something I made up, you know, almost 20 years ago now. And it's just, when I share that with an athlete, they get it. They automatically, like it just clicks. They're like, oh my gosh. And it clicks because most athletes train to justify their eating patterns, right? So, oh, I went for a long run. Therefore I can shove anything I want in my mouth. That's not true, right? So I'm trying to change, here comes the behavior, right? I'm trying to change the paradigm of the thought process and actually teach individuals and athletes in, in particular, how to eat to support and plan their training sessions. So if Roy has a long run on Sunday, we're gonna prepare for that. If he has a track session on Wednesday, we're gonna prepare for that, right? So that's the whole concept of nutrition periodization. It's actually not that difficult if you think of the big picture first. So that said, I've got five goals when it comes to why we use it. So obviously, as I mentioned, as, as Roy was, was interviewing me, right? I have a lot of athletes coming to me for weight loss, uh, body composition changes, right? So it, it helps to manipulate body weight and body composition changes safely and effectively. So there's not nothing crazy about it because it's periodized, right? As an example, if an athlete comes to me and they've got two weeks before, let's say the marathon, Roy, I'm just going to keep using you as an example, right? If he comes to me two weeks before the mar marathon and says, Bob, I'd really like to, to cut 10 pounds off my frame. I'm going to try to talk him out of that because it's not conducive to his performance and maybe not his health, right? But definitely not his performance, right? So we actually periodize these goals within an athlete's training year. The second thing is improving hormonal influence of appetite. That is really speaking more to the metabolic efficiency. So again, we'll talk about that on the second half of this webinar today. Uh, supporting the immune system and gut health. So we know that the immune system is largely uh, related to, to gut health and the microbiome. And we also know that as athletes train with more intensity and longer volume, longer duration, we know that there is immune suppression, right? So throughout the year, athletes will engage in higher immunosuppression versus lower immunosuppression. So we wanna periodize the antioxidant rich foods, the microbiome rich foods, the prebiotics, the probiotics to make sure everything is, is healthy in the gut so the immune system stays healthy. The fourth one is periodizing sports supplements. So I'm sure all of you have athletes asking you what supplements should I use, what bars, what drinks, what juice, what, 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 whatever it is, right? Um, so I always like to remind athletes that those, even like an energy bar, that's still a supplement to your food, to your daily nutrition. Like we wanna nail your daily nutrition first. And there's no reason you should, be, you should be consuming sports supplements every day throughout the entire year. So we wanna periodize those wisely. And then the last thing, it sounds a little bit weird, but this is kind of the behavior change part of it. We wanna create a healthy relationship with food. And, and I believe I've done that personally in my practice over the past 20 years, because I've gone away from counting and not focusing on numbers and not using body weight and not even using body composition sometimes, uh, and, and certainly not using calories or grams. I'd, I wanna try to get athletes off that train because it actually develops a healthier relationship with food. So a lot of the work that I do is, is more intuitive eating based and really looking at satiety and hunger signals and really looking at, it sounds weird, but looking at the why behind someone's eating. So as a quick example, I always have athletes keep a three-day food log before they work with me. It's just, you know, it's ingrained. That's what, that's what you do. Right. But I only ask them to log three things. So it's very, very different than what normal, well, what, what is a normal than a, a, a regular, I guess, dietitian would do. I only ask athletes to track when they eat, what they eat. And most importantly, it's not how much it's why. And that always throws athletes off. They're like, what do you mean, why? And I have to explain to them. I'm, I'm like, I want you to write down if you're hungry, if you're stressed, if you're for females, are you starting your menstrual cycle? Where are you in your menstrual cycle? So I want the athletes to actually describe the why behind why they're eating. Because as you all know, a lot of this is very non-intuitive eating and they're just eating out of emotion or out of habit, right? So we want to teach about more biological eating. So nutrition periodization allows us to structure more of this healthy relationship with food, which is a fantastic thing. Okay. So let me get back to the wonderful graphs because, because, you know, they're pretty, right? So this is how I look at nutrition periodization. So this is the big picture. Let me just dissect this for you. Periodization itself, like I said, physical periodization, 
uh, what, what, what athletes do in terms of training, there's always three cycles and three cycles alone. And that's what you see on the right. Those are the macro cycle, the meso cycle, and the micro cycle. So just to kind of put it in terms for the recreational athlete, not the Olympic athlete, but the recreational athletes, they follow a one year, what's called annual training plan. That is their macro cycle. So this is, you can think of that as the entire year, 12 months. The nutritional goal is teaching them about metabolic efficiency training. Again, I know I'm, I'm getting ahead right now, but that is really about learning how to optimize blood sugar through food. No dieting, no counting, none of that stuff. It's just looking at how food interacts with the body. That should be every single day education for athletes, right? So that's big picture. Coming down now, th these are the cycles, and this is what I was mentioning earlier, the meso cycles are typically about one to three, maybe even four months in length, depending on the athlete's coach. It, it all depends on how they coach athletes, right? But typically the preparatory phase, which you see on, in the teal portion on the left, that preparatory phase is like base training, right? They're starting to, to, to kind of trickle in the miles, they're adding some strength. They're basically getting their body ready to race, but they're not doing a lot of speed work yet, right? That's important to align. You're gonna see this on the next few slides here because the nutrition goals have to align with that. So as we go down that teal column, we see nutritionally, we're talking about how to pair food. We're talking about introducing antioxidant and anti-inflammatory rich foods, right? We're also kind of, as we're spilling into the micro cycle, we're talking about what do they do every day? What do they do before, during, and after workouts? Do they need post-workout nutrition? But I'm going to dissect each one of these training cycles with the nutrition goals in just one second. So give me just a, a, about a minute here. The competition cycle right in the middle, the yellow, that is typically higher intensity. And for some athletes, longer duration, depending on the sport and depending on the distance, right? So with that, we need to maybe shift the nutrition to a higher level because their energy expenditure is greater. Their economies of movement are, are, are greater. So we know that there's a higher VO2 uh, component. So nutritionally, we need to feed the right foods at the right time, right? From a transition or an off season, that's the green, that is typically nutritionally, we're talking normally about how do we just become weight stable for the most part, right? We talk about that emotional connection with food because once you tell an athlete that your season is over, they kind of check out sometimes, right? So sometimes that's a good thing, right? But physically, I try to have athletes maintain their weight instead of gain weight in the off season. The worst thing is for an athlete to come out of off season 10 to 20 pounds heavier because again, as you probably are aware, weight loss is behavior change driven, right? It's not as easy as calories in, calories out, right? 3,500 calories doesn't equal pound of fat. I'm sorry, right? It's like we've debunked that, right? So we really are talking about different nutrition goals based on the meso cycle of each year, okay? The micro cycle, as I, as I mentioned before, that's about a week, right? So about seven to 10 days, that is what the micro cycle is. So that's when we actually look at the week, what an athlete is doing every single day based on the quality of their training. So let me launch into this because I think this will make more sense now that we see this. We've got the three mesocycles. Now, the, the physical goals of each mesocycle is important when we're talking about how to structure an athlete's nutrition. So for example, if an athlete is in base training, so I'm just gonna assume, because not to muddy the waters, but there are a couple of different periodization models. I'm gonna talk about what's called the traditional periodization model where an athlete starts low volume, low intensity, very aerobic, and then they build up to moderate volume, moderate intensity, then they, they have a little bit higher, then they race and they have an off season, right? That's the traditional model that I would say 80% of athletes follow. Okay, that might, and almost all recreational athletes follow. It's not until they get into the highly competitive phases where they start their coaches start to uh, tinker around a little bit. So that said, as you see in the red, it's all about the physical goals. So for example, in that base training, if the goals are for that athlete to improve endurance and strength and flexibility and technique and whatever else it is, that's what we need to know in order to educate about nutrition. Same thing with competition, but you see what happens between base training and the race season is the intensity shift. So, so we're, we're using different words, right? We're using speed, economy, power, right? Those are higher intensity, which means the body is processing calories very differently. Thus, the feeding needs to be slightly different to support that, right? Again, let me take you through this here. Every mesocycle. So 
here are my goals. And this is general, right? Obviously every athlete is N of one and individual we have to customize, but here are my goals when it comes to each mesocycle. And this is general goals. So during base training, this is where I like to pop the hood. So basically we do as much biomarker testing as possible, right? It's basically like using literally the, the ultimate package uh, uh, for inside tracker and getting our baseline foundation before they start training a lot. Cause once they training, some of these markers are gonna get disrupted. So I like to pop the hood immediately. Like week one, they start training for something, they're getting their biomarkers, their blood work tested, and we've got that data, right? The second thing we look at is learning this whole eating to train mantra. And I only say that because I've seen so many, especially endurance athletes, make this mistake. They start training. And, and let's say for a marathon, right? I always have to remind athletes, I'm like, you're not going to run 26 miles the first day of training, right? It's just not going to happen. You're, you're preparing your body to, to adapt to this. What they don't understand is a lot of athletes think when they start training, they need to eat a ton of food to support that training. What they're not understanding is periodization, right? So I always uh, remind them and teach them we're going to focus on eating to support your training as it progresses or as it, it gets periodized throughout the whatever 12, 16, 20, 24 week uh, program that they're going to follow. So learning how to eat to train and getting them off the whole using food as a reward system. Okay. Uh, lastly, implement and periodize the metabolic efficiency training system. I keep on mentioning that you're going you're gonna to be wowed when I talk about it, but just let's push, push the pause button. But this is where we actually implement metabolic efficiency training because we have to start in the foundation level. Okay, Once they move into the next training cycle where they're doing more intensity, more repeats, more hills, you name it, they're getting ready to race. Now there's going to be energy deficiencies because their energy expenditure is higher. And it's usually only a few days a week, uh, depending on the sport, of course, but usually most athletes don't do more than three really high quality training sessions a week because they want to focus on recovery. So there's going to be some significant energy deficiencies at least two to three times a week. If it's a long run, it's a long bike. Uh, maybe it's if they're a triathlete, it's a, it's a combo or a brick day where they're biking and running or maybe even swimming, biking and running. So those are the, the times that we need to kind of focus in on. Those are what I call quality sessions. You have to kind of separate the quality session from the non-quality and not to make, not to sound bad, but the quality sessions really need to be focused on nutrition because that's where the potential deficiencies exist more than the non-quality. So example, if someone's a marathon runner, if, if uh, Roy is going to go run five miles aerobic, right? That's not a quality session. Yes. He's putting in miles. He's, he's adapting. Yes. But it's not until he does his 13 mile long run, maybe with some efforts or some strides, that's the quality. That's where the energy deficiencies are really going to get disrupted. Okay. This is also the time where we, we kind of highlight functional foods uh, and their role in inflammation, their role in oxidation, right? So using Inside Tracker Pro or, or Inside Tracker for, for looking at the biomarkers specifically and seeing if there are any low or high for that matter, and looking at the food component to specifically identify and kind of target inflammation and oxidation. Because again, with higher quality training comes a higher degree of inflammation and a higher degree of oxidation. Okay. This is also the time of the year where you really focus on developing that, that sound nutrient timing plan, right? And they'd actually practice their, their competition eating, right? Uh, a great example here. I've been working with a, a new Ironman athlete for about three months now, and uh, he's doing his first Ironman in a month. And throughout the last three months, we've been tinkering with his nutrient timing. Like, what does he eat during long bikes, during long runs? And it's so funny because we're a month out from his first Ironman and we've just about 99%, we've got his race day nutrition just dialed in. And he keeps asking me every week. He's like, so do you want me to change my, my nutrition, my, my quote unquote race day or competition day nutrition? And, and I have to remind him, I'm like, well, things are working, right? Like you're not getting GI distress, right? No, you're getting enough energy, right? Yeah. So you're able to run off the bike, right? Yeah. Are you recovering quickly? Yeah. So I said, well, why would we want to change anything? <laughs> so it's the whole, if it ain't broke, don't fix it concept. Uh, but this is also the time where you can tinker with different nutrient timing strategies, different, different foods, different products. Okay. And then this is actually the cycle, not to get too specific, but I'm just going to introduce this. I, I have got this thing that I call microcycle periodization. And that basically means this on a daily basis, we might feed a different amount of carbohydrate, protein, or fat 
to identify and to be able to support that day's session. So I kind of was talking about this a little bit in the past few minutes, but if, for example, say uh, Roy has a speed, like a, uh, a track session on Wednesday, long run on Sunday, I want to identify those, I want to target those, and I want to microcycle periodize his nutrition to support those training sessions. And in this case, I would likely feed a little bit more carbohydrate, not carbohydrate load, but I would likely feed more carbohydrate 16 to 24 hours before that session, because that's about the amount of time that it takes to fill up the glycogen gas tank, if you will, right? So you can get very specific and that is microcycle periodization or micro periodizing an athlete's nutrition plan. That's a little bit, a, a little bit on the, on the very detailed side, but I did want to share that with you. Okay. So the athlete races, they compete, they have a great race, and all of a sudden they are done training, right? So in, in comes the transition or the off season. This is hands down the most difficult training session ever for athletes because they're so used to training at a higher level and then they completely take away their training. But what they can't take away is the behaviors they develop for their eating patterns and their eating habits. So this is where that emotional connection to food comes in really, really heavy because they're so tied to certain foods and certain times throughout the day, they actually have to completely redistribute their behavior around their nutrition, their daily nutrition. So number one, they need to get rid of all the energy, all the supplements, the sports supplements. They don't need it if they're not training, right? The second thing is it takes about probably three to four weeks to completely reassign the behavior so I always tell athletes, be patient, but we're going to start small. We're going to start with little things like the smallest thing is, okay, let's get rid of sports supplements. Then we'll work on the next thing, right? So if you take it in chunks, I find that it works much more effectively because it gives them small, like weekly goals. And then by the end of the three or four weeks, they'll completely have that, that different paradigm of thought when it comes to nutrition for the off season. There will be some energy intake and energy expenditure differences. Obviously, they're not going to be training as much, so they don't need to eat probably the same volume. Right now, that's tricky because a lot of athletes, if you say don't eat as much, all of a sudden, now maybe this is just the population I work with, a little bit on the OCD type A behaviors, right? Personalities, what they're going to do is extremely cut their calories and their energy intake and now we have a different issue, right? So we really need to kind of balance that energy intake and energy expenditure based on the lack or, or, lit or less training during the cycle. As I said earlier, I really wanna prevent uh, fluctuations in body weight and body composition. I think it's, it's fine, I call it walking weight, but if an athlete competes at a, at a lower than normal walking weight, like their normal weight, I think it's fine to put on more, more uh, weights during the season. But if they're about normal weight, I try to introduce the whole not, in, not, not going up too much on the weight gain or the body composition. It's, it's tough for most athletes, unless they have a short off season, unless they have like a four week off season, it's very difficult for them to, to try to encounter. Okay, the last thing is continue metabolic efficiency training. Cause here's the thing I haven't told you yet because we haven't gotten to this. Metabolic efficiency, efficiency training, it's not a diet, right? It's a daily nutrition plan that focuses on optimizing blood sugar by basically periodizing carbohydrate, protein, and fat throughout the year. So, you know, whenever an athlete says, oh, are you gonna put me on a diet? What diet should I follow? What do you, I always, I always remind them this. If you follow a training plan, you should follow a nutrition plan, right? Why should you diet if you're trying to train? Like it just, it does not make sense to me, right? So, cause diets, as we all know, it's, it's a four letter word. It's very uh, short term. It's not successful long-term, right? So this is where it's really, really important to continue this metabolic efficiency training, which is basically the optimization or the control of blood sugar. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of an idea of where we are with nutrition periodization. Now we get into the next fun concept and that is my metabolic efficiency training concept. So not quite sure what your knowledge is on this. So I'm gonna start from ground zero here, right? As you can see from this wonderful slide, the foundation is, surprise, nutrition periodization, right? We have to understand what training cycle an athlete is in to first discuss where we should start navigating the daily nutrition plan, okay? So let me explain this. This is how I always explain metabolic efficiency training or MET, right? If you look at a bell-shaped curve, we've got our outliers. We always have outliers. So in this case, we have one set of outliers, and those are our LCHF, our low-carb, high-fat, 
or our keto or our other diets that really restrict, right? That's, that's one of our outliers. The other side of the outlier is our high carb, low fat. So that's the traditional, that's what I grew up with, right? Shove as many carbohydrates in your body and, and as low as fat as possible and maybe have lower protein, right? So those are the complete outliers. Some athletes I have noticed throughout the 20 years I've been doing this, they can pull it off and they can pull it off successfully. Mostly when they're younger, I've just noted that, um, you know, once they start hitting their fourth decade in life, things start to change significantly. But what we want to focus in on is really the middle, right? So we're talking like metabolic efficiency training, like I mentioned, is using food to optimize blood sugar. I'll explain why that's so important here in a second. But this whole metabolic efficiency training concept, 75% of it is nutrition based. 25% of it is exercise based. I'm not gonna discuss exercise after this little debrief for it really quick. From an exercise perspective, if we focus on aerobic exercise from an exercise physiology perspective or, or, con or standpoint, aerobic exercise improves beta oxidation at a cellular level, which means at a cellular level, if you follow true aerobic training, that will improve the body's ability to utilize its fat stores as energy, okay? We've wiped our hands clean. What I have found when I was actually looking at all this from a scientific standpoint, looking at the research almost 20 years ago, was that nobody ever looked at the nutrition and the food component. And what I found as I was tinkering and doing a lot of uh, N of ones uh, examples based on the research, what I found was nutrition has the most robust effect in changing the way the body uses calories, okay? So let me go on a little bit with this here. Metabolic efficiency training is basically this, teaching our body to use either carbohydrates more efficiently or fat more efficiently. And I say it like that because some athletes will want to use more carbs, right? And usually that's your short course or your short distance endurance athlete. It could be the 5K or maybe the 10K or uh, the sprint triathlon, uh, even like a, a, in terms of cycling, maybe it's a crit, uh, which is usually 60 minutes or less or cyclocross, something like that. When you get into longer training, like the half marathon, half Ironman and above, that's when we start to really focus on how do we actually tap into our fat stores to teach them basically, or teach our body how to use more of those fat stores. Because here's the thing, if you teach your body to use more fat, oxidize more fat, you're actually gonna preserve carbohydrates. So, and this is basic biochemistry 101, right? The more carbohydrates you eat, the more carbohydrates your body burns. Hmm, interesting. We know we don't store a lot of carbs in our body. So depending on gender and size, right? Most carbohydrates are stored in the muscles with a little bit in the liver and a little bit uh, circulating in the blood, right? But most of it is muscle-based. So if you get a smaller petite female, she's only gonna store 1,200, 1,400 calories of carbohydrates, right? Larger males will store 1,800 or 2,000 calories. Now, here's the thing you need to remember if you're working specifically with, with, well, any athlete, but specifically with endurance athletes. Athletes have roughly two to two and a half hours worth of carbohydrate stores at moderate intensity, right? So if, if someone goes out for a moderate intensity run or bike ride or whatever it is, they can go about two to two and a half hours running on their carbohydrate stores, as long as they're not following something, you know, ketogenic or low carb, high fat, because obviously they have less carbohydrate stores in that scenario. So thinking about that and, and, and looking at that, there presents a huge issue here because, and this is what, what I kind of went back when I was developing this, I kind of went back to my exercise physiology uh, research and, and work there. And I was like, well, wait a second, if we don't store a lot of carbs, but we store, as you see on the screen, upwards of 80,000 or more calories as fat, right? You can't always see it, but it's, it's stored. And even like your leanest of lean, like even like if you guys watch the Olympic marathon, right? They're still storing about 30,000 to 40 or 50,000 calories from fat. So I actually asked the question way, way, way early on. I was like, wait a second, there's this huge, huge difference here. Is there, and this is exactly what I asked. Can we teach the body to use more of the fat and actually store the carbohydrates until we really need those carbohydrates. So when do you need carbohydrates? You need carbohydrates when the intensity increases. We all know this, right? And I'm gonna show you in the next few slides here, it's called the crossover concept, which I've kind of adapted for metabolic efficiency. But the whole, con the whole point of this slide is, is, is remembering that we store a bunch of fat. We don't store as many carbohydrates. 
if we can teach our body to oxidize fat, we preserve carbohydrate. The opposite is actually true also. If we teach our body to burn carbs, we store more fat. And remember what, what, when we introed me, right? Most of the clients I see are those who want weight loss or body composition. So obviously this makes sense. So here's, here's the secret. It's not even a secret, right? There's no special diet to do this. There's no, you don't have to put that diet handcuffs on. It is all regulated based on blood sugar. Okay, remember that. We'll come back to that in a second. Let me share a little bit of the past with you. So when I was looking at this 17, 18 years ago, I went back to exercise physiology research and you know, I was thinking, God, did I miss something in my studies? And I found this, and you can look at any exercise physiology textbook and you open it up somewhere in that book, you will see a graph that looks like this. This is called the crossover concept, okay? Let me just briefly explain this to you. The blue line, is the percentage of carbohydrates oxidized or burned. The red line is the percentage of fat burned or oxidized, right? All this says is at a higher degree of intensity, the body will shift or cross from fat metabolism, from primarily fat metabolism into carbohydrate metabolism. Now, here's a misnomer. We never utilize all fat or all carbohydrate. I think I, I really get sick of people saying, oh yeah, you're burning all fat. Well, no, 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 you're, you're really not. I mean, even when you're sleeping, you're still utilizing carbohydrates because your brain needs carbohydrates, your heart, your lung, everything needs carbohydrates, right? But what we know is at a certain degree of intensity, we know the body shifts from, from using more fat into needing more carbohydrate. Now, back in the days, and this is in the 1950s, 1960s, this is what I was talking about earlier, it was only an exercise modality driven concept. So basically this is where aerobic training comes in. And I know you guys know this. Have you seen, I don't even know if they still put it like on treadmills and ellipticals, but have you ever seen those charts that has the fat burning zone and they've got it different colors and everything that was based on this research, what 60, 70 years ago now, right? And all it says, remember what I said earlier is when you do more aerobic training, that teaches from a cellular level that teaches your body to burn fat. And here's the secret. They found this to be between 63 to 65% of max intensity, which could be heart rate or it could be VO2 max or VO2 peak, right? That's why everyone says stay under 65% of your max intensity, heart rate, VO2, whatever, and you'll burn more fat. So I was really intrigued by this. I was like, oh, that's interesting. I remember learning about that, right? But then I was like, well, why, why isn't anyone mentioning nutrition? Like what if we adapt different carbohydrates, protein, fat? That is where metabolic efficiency really came in. So here's where we are now. What we know is because I said earlier, 75% of the game, and I, I hate to call it a game, but 75% of the, the body's ability to utilize more fat as energy and store carbohydrates more efficiently is from nutrition. It's from blood sugar regulation right? So what we know, interestingly enough, and as you can see on the slide, like I do, I do metabolic efficiency testing all the time. I actually, yes, I coined the topic for the concept metabolic efficiency training. I also developed the test, the exercise physiology testing protocol using my exercise physiology degree, right? Or, or experience. So I actually can measure this using a metabolic cart, super, super easy, but here's what we know. We can adapt the body. So what you see down here is I personally have tested athletes who have a metabolic efficiency point that is 87% of VO2 max. Remember what I said on the previous slide that was only based on exercise? They found it, you can only burn more, you can only burn a predominant amount of fat up to 65%. Well, I've actually proved that wrong to say you can actually burn more fat at higher intensities. It is true. So everyone's saying, oh no, no you can't burn fat at higher intensities. Yes, you can. You can adapt the body. The body's actually very smart. You just have to teach it and train it, right? So luckily, there was actually some research, which you can see that came out in 2017 to prove the same thing. So me and my little lab here in Colorado, you know, that's one thing. But when you get a research study that says, oh yeah, we looked at all these athletes and we did find, they actually found, what is this? Let me move, let me move you guys around. I think it's uh, 89% of VO2 max. So the whole concept here is, you can teach the body to burn more fat at higher intensity, mostly through nutritional shifts. So I say that because I sometimes, like if an athlete comes to me with about four weeks before their competition and they want to become more 
I hate to use this term, but I'm going to use it fat adapted. It, like it's so cliche these days, right? But I, I use metabolically efficient, right? If they want to be more metabolically efficient, I basically tell them, I'm not going to ask you to do anything differently with your training because you're getting ready for your competition for goodness sake, right? I'm just going to adapt your nutrition to support your body's ability to use fat and store carbohydrate. Beautiful thing. We know it works. It's actually proven. Unfortunately, not a lot of people know about it, right? This is where we're going to kind of leave this. This is why I need you to, I keep on coming back to this blood sugar regulation optimization. This is a very unhappy blood sugar line. And unfortunately, a lot of athletes follow this. And I'll tell you why here in a second. But as the blood sugar goes up and down like this, kind of like a roller coaster, it impairs some really, really bad hormonal effects on the body, specifically the, the secretion of insulin from the pancreas and high insulin is usually not a good thing when it comes to trying to adapt the body to utilize more of its fat stores. So obviously we want to come up with an eating plan that supports more of a happy blood sugar line. So we just want these little ebbs and flows versus these spikes. So why, why is this all important? Because if an athlete follows the blood sugar roller coaster, they're going to reduce their mental performance. Cause here's the thing, the brain is very, very finicky, right? When your blood sugar goes up and down, cognitive status is actually aligned to your blood sugar. So when you're having a blood sugar crash, remember when those cravings, right? You're, you're, you're craving because you're coming down in your blood sugar and your brain just wants something that is sugar-based. And that's why a lot of athletes will go either to caffeine because they're trying to mask the, the fatigue or they go to high sugar foods because the brain is actually asking for sugar, right? So we know that, that blood sugar roller coaster affects mental, affects physical performance, decreases focus and concentration. It disrupts body weight and body composition changes, uh, increases hunger, decreases the feeling of fullness. Here's what you really need to know. Whenever the blood sugar is high, like at that peak of the roller coaster, the body, like I said, the pancreas secretes insulin. One of insulin's jobs, that hormone insulin, is to reduce blood sugar, right? So everything is, is, is great, you go on about your day, but here's the thing that not a lot of people remember from their biochemistry 101 class. Whenever insulin is high, it just about turns off the body's ability to use fat as energy. So if you eat a food, and I'll get into this in just one second, if you eat a food that spikes your blood sugar and your blood sugar is high, insulin is high, pretty much turns off. I mean, it's like a dimmer switch, but it's pretty low. Turns off the, pretty much turns off the body's ability to utilize fat. So what are you doing? By increasing blood sugar and getting this spike, you're teaching your body to accelerate carbohydrate oxidation, of which you have very few stores of carbohydrate relative to fat. You're also teaching your body to store more fat. Now, again, maybe it's only my practice, although I know it's not. A lot of athletes care about body weight and body fat composition. If you ever work with longer distance endurance athletes, the regulation of fat and actually teaching the body to burn fat as an energy source long term is absolutely a necessity, right? So here in Colorado, last weekend and this weekend are huge right now because I don't know if you guys have ever heard the Leadville 100. Leadville 100 mountain bike was the last weekend. It's 100 miles, basically above 10,000 feet. And this weekend is the Leadville 100 run, 100 miles above 10,000 feet. So if you can imagine, there is for the run this weekend, there's a 30 hour cutoff. If you can imagine trying to carry all of your nutrition, your carbohydrate needs for 30 hours, it's kind of a difficult task to do, right? So the concept of improving the body's ability to burn fat or metabolic efficiency actually improves the body's ability to store carbohydrates, use fat as energy. Thus, you don't need a lot of uh, supplemental carbohydrates during a competition. You're still going to need to feed, but instead of maybe 300 calories an hour, maybe it's 150, maybe it's 200. So that's another benefit of metabolic efficiency. In addition to decreasing the body's response to GI problems. So that wonderful gastrointestinal monster that a lot of endurance athletes get regulating blood sugar is proven to reduce GI distress. So there's so many incredible benefits of, of regulating blood sugar. How do we do it? Well, I'm going to share with you a little bit more on our next webinar, right? But I will give you this. I'm, I'm going to just kind of put the carrot in front of you. Looking at the proportion or the ratio of carbohydrate and protein and just a little bit of fat 
there is an ideal ratio of looking at carbs to protein that will either spike your blood sugar or that will keep your blood sugar nice and manageable. Obviously, depending on how we periodize an athlete's nutrition plan, we're gonna choose one or two of the different ratios depending on their training cycle, depending on their health goals, and possibly depending on the biomarkers that we found during that foundation when we pop the hood, we use inside tracker and we look at all these great biomarkers. So I'm kind of teasing you a little bit because I want I want you to visit me on the second part of this webinar. So I will leave it at this and then we'll open up questions, right? Basically, we are looking through a different, really through a different looking glass working with athletes these days. It's like, I, I remember when I first started, I would literally give presentations on what a carbohydrate was, what a protein was, what a fat was. And then I progressed into saying, you know, it's a little bit different than that. It's looking at how we use these nutrients different times throughout the year to elicit different health goals and different performance related goals. And it's really about using nutrition periodization as the foundation and then metabolic efficiency, which is basically optimizing blood sugar through food intake and different food intake. It's not always the same, right? We want to do that because from a hormonal level, we can actually teach the body to do a lot of different things and to be a little more, I guess, steady, if you will, right? So I know I'm teasing you just a little bit, but that was kind of the plan so we can get you excited for my next webinar. So with that, let's go ahead and open up for, oh, here's my contact information. Actually, if you want to learn more about metabolic efficiency, I've got an entire website, it's metabolicefficiency.org, gives you the background, gives you some information about it, some resources. I always, I always send athletes there too, but that'll give you a little bit more information. In addition, if you want to learn more about the testing, you can go to my energy performance website, click on metabolic efficiency testing, and it actually describes the entire test, the deliverables. So if you're kind of that quantitative geek like I am, I think that part will excite you also. But let's go ahead and, and open it up to questions now. Bob, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, that was um, really informative. So uh, That was a lot, I wasn't it? And I went over my um, time. I told you I would. I told you. I tried well, to keep it in 30 done. minutes. No, you, you, you clearly, you've clearly done this before. You, um, it's definitely a lot, but um, you you made it very easy to understand. So thank you. Um, so let's just dive in um, to a few of the, the questions that I see here. So um, Jackie, you asked in the beginning um, if Bob was talking, I think when he was describing if he got into um, – uh, why he got into coaching, uh, if it was health coaching. So Bob, um, I, I think you were saying nutrition coaching. That's, that's really what you're focused on. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, so you're asking like what I do more of right now? Well, you Check mentioned that you yeah. kind of, yeah, when, throughout your career, you kind of started adapting more behavioral focused, um, yes. nutrition and yeah. as someone who just got my master's in nutrition, I, I was considering oh. health coaching. And I was wondering if that is something that, um, that type of education and training would be uh, helpful in the clinical setting. Yeah, Jackie, definitely. I mean, so health coaching is booming right now. I don't know if you if you knew that, but depending on like if your master's was an RD focus, like it was didactics or not, um, whether you wanted to get your RD or not. I mean, regardless, the your master's in nutrition will definitely set you up for good health coaching. However, here's what I still see the deficiency at least in undergraduate nutrition these days is still, they don't focus on a lot on behavior change. Like literally it took my exercise science degree to introduce more of that, which is still shocking to me, right? I thought I would get it in nutrition and I really didn't a lot. So I think it will depend on the program, but you're definitely set up well to introduce yourself to the health coaching realm. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks Jackie. So the next question is from Christina. Christina, you can unmute and Feel free to ask Bob your question. Hi, yeah, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I'm wondering if there's a youngest age that you would impl implement metabolic efficiency training or periodization. Um, I work with a lot of high schoolers, um, and so I'm just curious, like, what is what do you think is appropriate? I have found Christine a great question. Um, I actually specialize in working with young athletes, uh, and I have found that I can start even in middle school. So I'll, let me let me just say like seventh or eighth grade, I think is still ideal because they're still shaping their behaviors. The challenge, honestly, is parents. It's not necessarily the kids and in in their knowledge. It's the parents, because if you think about it before they drive, before they have money, like they are limited to what mom and dad do at the grocery store. So that sometimes 
gets in the way, if you will, of what we're trying to do with them. But de definitely high school for sure. I would even, I mean, I like to start at seventh or eighth grade because they're definitely ready for the information. Um, yeah, no, I, I totally understand. And I have two more questions. Um, yep. How would you frame this um, for stop and go sports? Yep. Super easy, actually. So you're talking more strength and power based or even team sports, soccer, basketball, yep. stuff like yep. that. Yeah, super, super, super easy. Because basically, once you get their foundation nutrition set, and I'm going to talk to you guys about this on the next webinar, but you know, when we get the carbohydrate to protein ratio set, then it's all about nutrient timing. Right. So on one hand, Monday through Sunday, we're periodizing their carbohydrates, their protein differently. But then before, during, and after a session, we periodize it very differently than like an endurance athlete because we know it's it has more. Basically, we're looking at energy systems. Right. We're looking at the contribution from a higher anaerobic energy system, which is more glycolytic, which is more carbohydrate dominant, and that's why we need to make sure the nutrient timing is more favoring that carbohydrate status versus endurance athletes. Right. It's more of an aerobic component component, which is usually not all, but most, I'm not even gonna say most, some endurance athletes are more metabolically efficient or fat adapted than anaerobic sport based. Um, yeah, that's awesome. And then my third and final question, um, I know you mentioned before that you really uh, created this, so that way you could speak the same languages as the athletes and the coaches. Um, what would be your best advice or top two or three um, for dietitians to speak the same language? I think that's something that's a big challenge right now. Oh, it's so difficult, especially if, and, and this is the the unfortunate state of the nation with dietitians and nutrition professionals, let's just say nutrition professionals these days, or is they, there isn't a strong exercise science background. Like you may have a few classes here or there. And I see a lot of dietitians these days kind of going back for their master's degree in ex phys or sports or something, uh, which is great, right? I feel like you have, to, you have to have some of that. It doesn't need to be a whole degree, but in order to really talk to a strength coach, a performance coach, you know, endurance coach, football coach, whomever, you need to learn about periodization first and foremost. And you need to learn, not that you have to be a strength coach, but you need to be able to go in a weight room and like talk the talk, walk the walk kind of a thing and be on the same plan. So I always tell my, my budding sport dietitians, my registered dietitians, I always say, learn what periodization is, then always ask questions to these coaches, to these professionals, what periodization cycle are you in? What are you trying to do with those athletes right now? Is it more anaerobic or aerobic based, right? Once you start asking those intelligent questions, you will earn their respect very quickly because now you're not just talking about food, you're actually putting it into their world. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, great questions. Thanks, Christina. Uh, Kristen, you had the... Next question. Waiting for my video to come on. Hey, Bob, I was just wondering how you implement Inside Tracker with clients and do you require it? Oh, gosh, that's, that's a really good question. Uh, I've been battling this for, with about, for about five years now. I want to make this mandatory. And I'll tell you what. Since using Inside Tracker, it's actually it's it's kind of coming more to life and more to fruition now. But here's what we battle. Here's what I battle. I'm sure all of you battle. We're battling insurance and in the United States, right? And that is my huge battle right now because when I tell athletes, hey, if you want to work with me, I need these biomarkers, right? And they say, oh, I'll just go to my doctor. I'm like, here's what a doctor is going to give you. They're going to give you a CBC. They're not going to look at the markers I want and I need, right? So once you talk to them, they're like, oh, okay, that's great. And then you share with them, oh, you know, inside tracker, ultimate package. And they're, I'm not going to lie, like they still have sticker shock, even, even with our incredible, you know, discount that we're able to give, right? They're still like, oh my gosh, insurance doesn't cover that, right? And luckily, like in my practice, I have always been cash pay. I've never, never taken insurance. So that kind of that kind of introduces that a little bit differently, but that is my biggest hurdle right now. So while I would love to make it mandatory, I do have to respect the financial situation of a lot of people. However, here's, here's my in. When we have like our first or second session and I start talking about these biomarkers, the impact of nutrition on these certain things and maybe why they're feeling a certain way and they haven't had any biomarkers tested, 
guess what ends up happening? They're the first to sign up, right? They're like, oh, maybe I should get that, right? And, and this is the way I teach athletes. Like I, I love working with endurance athletes because they're such geeks, right? And they've got so many toys in terms of equipment. It, you name the sport, it could be running shoes, could be bikes, like whatever. I'm like, if you're budgeting for these, even race entry fees, budget $500 a year, $1,000 a year, whatever it is, budget that to do biomarker testing. Like once you introduce it in that manner, it becomes real life. Like it becomes something that they're able to do instead of this huge hurdle. So it, it's still a huge frustration. It's still a huge mountain I climb, but but I've been able to chip away with it over really over the past few months with the, with the help of Inside Tracker, honestly. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Kristen. So we have one more question in the chat, um, Jackie, from you. Yeah, I was just, you know, thinking back to my old kinesiology days and the crossover point looked very similar to lactate threshold. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Is that something that you test when you're evaluating MEP? You all? can. Yeah, you don't have to, but you certainly can. So I actually started back in the early days, I started to try to align those two. And I found that in 95% of the athletes I tested, they never were even close. So for example, an, an athlete can have a really well-developed lactate threshold point, but their nutrition can be completely horrible. So normally I would say 90% of the time in an athlete's metabolic efficiency points happens way before their lactate threshold. I've literally only tested two athletes and these were Olympic endurance athletes where they were very, very close to each other. But you know, nowadays I don't strive for that anymore. Like back in the days I was like, oh no, we want to get those as close as possible. But these days I'm just like, I'm trying not to throw a lot of different confusion onto an athlete's plate. Like I'm like, if we can just start with nutrition and affect the metabolic efficiency point, let's start there. And then we'll talk about lactate threshold a little bit later. Okay, cool. Yeah. I have like yeah. another, another question. Um, is there any future collab with uh, Inside Tracker and like a continuous glucose monitor or perhaps even looking at fasting insulin in terms of like understanding more of, um, you know, clients individual glucose regulation? I can probably answer that one. Um, yeah, I, I definitely cannot answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, CGMs are pretty hot these days, Jackie. So we're actually looking at it pretty closely. Um, we're focused right now on the wearable devices just because um, we have a couple integrations now with Fitbit and Garmin. We're working on Apple Health. So that's a big one. Um, so we're focused on rounding those out, getting the big three out um, so that we have an Apple Health integration. Um, CGMs, we're looking at... Um, as a potential future input. So we are looking at it very closely. I wouldn't be surprised if it's something that we incorporate sometime in 2022 into the platform, but I, I can't guarantee it for sure. Yeah, I feel like it'd be awesome to for clients to have like physical data of what their glucose is doing at all times in order to help uh, motivate them for those behavior changes that I'm sure you'll get into. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's one of the things that the devices do is that we get more regular and continuous data on what they're doing right now. It's heart rate, sleep and activity, right? But adding that glucose and the continuous monitoring of the glucose is something that we're looking at very closely, especially because glucose is a, a critical marker in our inner age calculation as well. Um, so having that more regularly measured is something that would be really valuable to us. Nice. So we're a little bit over, but are there any final questions for Bob while we have him here? Doesn't sound like it. Okay. I'm sure everyone's excited for part two, right? I really um, love that carrot dangling. Yeah, well, I am, so I'm sure they are. <laughs> um, all right, well, let's wrap it up. So, Bob, thank you so much. This is awesome, really. Uh, it's um, my pleasure. Yeah, thank you, everyone, for, for enjoying this and uh, joining us and for the invitation.